Three, two, one, here we go. Rain Man's Take Podcast. Observations on the world we live in. My take on current events and other topics of interest. Also, interviews with some really cool people. So let's get the conversation going. Hey everybody, it's the Rain Man, bringing you a raindrop today. I want to give you some, uh, some of my opinions and my take on things that I see happening in our society right now um, that are, at this point, I think should be cause for concern for everybody. Um, but thankfully, I don't think we're at a critical, uh, critical mass just yet. Um, so I'm kind of calling this raindrop a boiling a frog. I don't think we're at the boiling point yet, but um, there are some trends that I see happening um, throughout our society that uh, definitely have cause for concern. And I just want to pass it on to you so that you can do some, uh, some more research on your own and make your own opinions as to, uh, as to where this is all going to, all going to end up. But before I start uh, next week, I've got another uh, great interview lined up for you. So keep an eye out for that. And again, if you do like what we're doing over here at Rain Man's Take, uh, please hit the like button and subscribe. That way we can continue to, uh, to bring you some great content. So with all that being said, let's kind of dig right into it. So my take on what's going on right now, um, it seems like there are forces inside and outside our country that have been working behind the scenes to undermine our republic. And in that world, and in the world of COVID, now are making a full court press to do serious damage to our way of life. And hopefully it's not too late. So um, just going to kind of lay those out and then at the end kind of give you my, my take on where I think this is all, where I think this is all heading and potentially why it may not be as, um, as dire uh, a situation as, as maybe we, we all think it might be right now. So uh, I've been reading a lot of unnerving articles about what is being quote unquote planned for the world. And I want to at least bring it to your attention so you guys can do the research yourself and kind of under, better understand what's going on. Um, I say planned in quotations uh, because this is what some of the most powerful people in the world want for, for the world. And those are the people, those are the elites, the politicians, um, the businessmen. Those are the ones that meet annually in, uh, in Davos, Switzerland, the World Economic For uh, For uh, Forum is uh, uh host that and it's basically where they all come together and kind of uh talk and figure out which direction we uh they want they want the world to go um they also meet in jackson hole and several other of these kind of big uh meetings where the world's elites uh get together and uh, supposedly just chat but uh as we'll see um some of the things that they uh that they talk about actually come to fruition so it's uh, it's no longer in the realm of conspiracy theory in my mind. Uh, we're actually seeing some of these things actually taking place. So um, you read articles and watch what's going on and you kind of begin to connect the dots. Of, hey, right now the direction that, that the uh, elites of the world want uh, the world to go um, may, not be, uh, may not be the best for the citizens of the world. So I'll kind of talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, obviously, this is my own speculation and my own opinion on what's going on, but I at least want to bring it to your attention. So a uh, couple of the, the main points I want to hit on. Are one, uh, it seems like there is a well-planned attack from not only the mainstream media, but the politicians and entertainment and sports figures to really do some damage to, uh, to our society. Uh, some might even say to tear down the United States as we currently know it. Um, and the reason why I, I mention this is, you know, obviously all the illegal aliens that are, that are uh, coming across the border in the crisis of our Southern border right now, um, that woke mentality of, of several very high, uh, uh, high visibility uh, athletes and celebrities. And then um, to counter that, which I'll talk about in uh, shortly, you have um, on the flip side of that coin, and I think it, this is the majority of people. However, uh, it's usually that, that small group of really loud uh, whiners that get all the press, but you have a majority of, of people that I think are still doing the right thing. And I highlight that by just using a couple of examples of those uh, beautiful black 
women athletes uh, in the Olympics in the track and field and just how awesome that was to watch. And then uh, the second point I want to talk about is pertaining to the World Economic uh, Forum and what uh, they are calling the Great Reset. And we'll go into that in more detail. But basically, um, it's stated in, in, their, in their plan for the Great Reset is to restructure global capitalism. And where does that put us? And where does that put the U.S. quality of life and our standard of living? Um, obviously, if, if a global governance that is shifting towards socialism um, that will have an extremely negative effect on our, 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 uh, our life, our quality of life and our standard of living um, in those type of things where there's total top down control, everybody becomes equal. But the problem is that equality is way down low. It's not, people aren't going to become equal to our way of life. It's going to be the exact opposite. So there's some serious negative consequences uh, to that for, for people living in the United States. And then finally, I just want to close up by by talking about what I where I think this is going, and uh, and and then my opinion on um, why it may not be uh, as close to a reality as um, sometimes I worry it might be. Okay, first point is um, why do I say it feels like there is a coordinated attack uh, to tear down the U.S. Um, first, uh, either by it seems to me that there's a couple things going on right now. They're either trying to divide the country to the point of a, of a civil war, which I don't think would happen realistically, or they are trying to disenfranchise half of the population into thinking that uh, the path that the current left wants to take the United States, that that path is, in inev is inevitable. And there's no use trying to stop that march towards a socialistic uh, type society. And then, um, I want to start with the border. Uh, this is where I think um, uh, there's a there's a major problem, and 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 the the flood of illegal aliens that are entering the United States. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that most Democrats in D.C. were in favor of a wall and border security. And I just bring your attention to an article I read uh, on the CNN Politics website in 2019. The author had mentioned. Um, back in 2016. So 15 years ago, everybody was on board with this. Um, he talks about uh, Joe Biden speaking to a South Carolina Rotary Club in 2006. Biden, uh, Biden touted his support for the Secure Fence Act, a bill that authorized 700 miles of double layered fence on the border through more than a billion dollars in appropriations. The bill was also supported by then Senators Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. And, and that's, just, that's just three of them, but the vast majority of Democrats uh, were all in favor of that, uh, of that act. Um, and just as an aside, uh, during my research, I came across a uh, speech that Obama gave in 2014. And tell me if you've heard this before and we've seen this before and tell me how you think it, uh, it played out. The speech was from Obama in 2014. This comes directly from the uh, transcript of that speech. Uh, Obama, quote, I've sent a clear message to parents in these countries not to put their kids through this, meaning the unaccompanied minors coming up through the border. I recently sent Vice President Biden to meet with Central American leaders and find ways to address the root causes of this crisis. Secretary Kerry will also be meeting with those leaders again. Um, that is exactly what Biden said when he uh, sent Kamala Harris down to uh, those South American countries recently. So uh, seven years ago, um, they tried and, and nothing seemed to happen. And uh, they tried again and, and nothing seems to be uh, happening. So um, just bring that to your attention that I found that uh, absolutely Unbelievable that uh, that Biden was doing the exact same thing as as uh, Obama six years ago, um, or seven years ago. Excuse me. So you have to ask yourself why the complete flip flop from Democrats. I believe they want to destabilize. I, I believe that they want the destabilization that this crisis brings, because as Rahm Emanuel infamously said, "Don't let a good crisis go to waste." And by that, I mean, it allows you to do things you otherwise would not be able to do. So, uh, so the fact that now everybody's against a wall and want unlimited uh, immigration, um, you just have to ask yourself why. And, and 
for me personally, it's that destabilization effect of, of that particular crisis. And many Americans see how disastrous it is to have such a porous border right now, especially the, uh, the border states and the border counties. Um, it is the classic Hegelian dialect where uh, you create a problem and then you come up with uh, solutions to that problem that you created. And in most cases, that means more government control and less freedom for the citizens. My opinion is the left wants to change the demographics of the country to have a majority that is completely dependent on the government for their for every aspect of their lives in turn for obedience and support permanent single party rule is never a good thing just look what's going on in california right now remember what do all totalitarian regimes have in common and this is this is going back in history russia china wherever it is all those totalitarian regimes have one of the one of the things that they all have in common is uh, single party rule with only token opposition. I agree there needs to be comprehensive immigration reform, but a secure border, which includes a wall, among other things, I think is imperative. Then uh, another point is the rise in violent crime that's currently going on in the uh, in the major U.S. cities. And why is that happening right now? Well, one of the things that, that you definitely should be aware of is uh, George Soros and George Soros affiliates who are financially assisting several radical uh, district attorneys in their, uh, in their getting elected in these most recent uh, uh, waves of elections. And almost all of them are in cities that have seen drastic increases in crime since they took office. So I don't believe that there is a coincidence here um, that these attorneys, district attorneys are elected and then all of a sudden crime seems to start uh, to start increasing on in all of those areas. And it seems like the, the kind of social fabric is, is breaking down in these areas. And just to use a couple of examples, uh, in an article by uh, James Varney in the Washington Times in 2020, Billionaire Democratic donor George Soros bankrolled the successful campaigns of a new crop of district attorneys who now preside over big cities with skyrocketing crime and frayed relationships with police departments. And I'll just use uh, I'll just use one example. But Soros backed uh, uh, DAs in Philadelphia, St. Louis, San Francisco, and other cities have fired scores of experienced prosecutors, and as promised, stopped prosecuting low-level quality of quality of life crimes, such as disorderly conduct, vagrancy, loitering, and then as we've seen in San Francisco, um, petty theft, which doesn't look as, uh, that petty to me. Anyway, to use one of those examples uh, in St. Louis, uh, he further writes, I would describe, oh, this is part of the article, I would describe it as abysmal, Jeff Ruda, general manager of the St. Louis Police Officers Association, said when asked about uh, the cops' relationships with circuit attorney Kimberly Gardner, who is one of those, uh, those attorneys that was, uh, had serious backing from, uh, from the Soros affiliates. The city has suffered a crime surge since a Soros-backed prosecutor took office. Violent crime rose by 8.8 percent since 2006. In terms of violent crimes per 100,000 residents, St. Louis has now surpassed Detroit as America's most violent city. And in her, in her, uh, in uh, Kimberly Gardner's campaign in 2016, her campaign received more than $190,000 from PACs, to which Mr. Soros is the sole or principal contributor. His PAC. His PACs have poured at least $116,000 into her re-election campaign this year, um, which was 2020. And again, that's just one example, but you've got, um, you've got these district attorneys in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Boston, Chicago, Dallas, Portland, and Philadelphia. And it's happening in all of those cities right now. And finally, uh, uh, for, this, uh, for this article, Cully Stimson, a former prosecutor and now a senior legal fellow at the Conservative Heritage Foundation, said of the Soros-backed prosecutors, what they run on and what they practice is wholesale abrogation of their duties, taking whole classes of crimes and reclassifying them as not crimes. Where they have taken office, there's been an institutional breakdown of civic and professional norms. Also keep in mind that uh, Soros has also spent about $33 million in support of BLM and his Open Society Foundation has had a hand in many of the recent uh, color revolutions happening around the world. And if you notice um, what's going on in America 
after uh, after all of the uh, riots last year. Um, there are some people that are calling this a color revolution as well. So keep that in mind as you're watching the news. In other country, so Soros is uh, his open society foundation has had a hand in many of the recent color revolutions, and in other countries around the world where their political, where their politics and societies have been completely turned on their head. So. Um, that seems to be a trend that the U.S. is heading towards, and I don't think it's good. So if you only get your news from mainstream news outlets, uh, or you actually take anything that Hollywood celebrities or many famous athletes say seriously, if you're one of them, you would think that America is the worst place to live on earth. So why are they doing this? My take is this coordinated attack is to make the regular citizen lose faith in the American dream. In my view, loss of faith equals loss of will to protect what we have in this country. The American dream of a person able to rise as high as their will, belief, motivation, and skills will take them. That is not a white supremacist mentality. That is an American mel melting pot mentality. And I could go on for days with examples of, of this in every walk of life, every ethnicity, uh, that it's happening here in America. So uh, don't lose faith in that. And... Um, my personal opinion is I, I don't listen to anything that they that a celebrity or a sports um, star says anyway, but um, take that for, for what it's worth. Uh, has America done regrettable things in the past? Yes. Have we learned from them? I believe absolutely. And I think we are a better country for it, not worse because of those past transgressions. Thankfully, I also believe that this woke, outspoken celebrity persona is actually starting to eat itself. I think it's reaching a critical mass. And I use a couple of examples. Um, well, first, I find it hard to relate or commend an athlete for telling me how horrible the United States is, when in actuality, they epitomize the fulfillment of the American dream. And in most cases, they're unbelievably wealthy but they make it so much about themselves that they lose focus and actually fail at what they're paid to do. As evidenced by the lackluster performance of several of these athletes in the, uh, in the current Olympic games in Tokyo and the subsequent drubbing they've taken on social media. And let me say this right now, I am not referring to uh, Simone Biles. As a matter of fact, um, I actually empathize with, with her situation because it, to me, it showed just how intense the pressure can be at that level of human endeavor and how it can hobble even the best. That's showing the human side of what I consider to be a superhuman talent. She was also dealing with several personal issues that increased that pressure. But as someone who's played sports, I can relate. Uh, it also makes me admire and respect even more the athletes who are uh, who can handle that type of pressure and compartmentalize it to the point where it doesn't affect their performance uh, in the in the sport that they're playing. And I find that I find that a fascinating um, human uh, condition. Another reason I think the woke mentality has peaked is there are too many examples in the current Olympic Games, and I'll just use that as an example, of U.S. athletes winning and actually being proud of the country that has given them so much opportunity. And I use a couple of examples here. Um, Tamara Mensa Stock, who, were the, uh, who won gold in the women's uh, wrestling um, her interview afterwards was just awesome. She's draped in the flag after winning the gold medal and she's thanking God and celebrating the fact that she loves living in America and all the opportunities that has, that it has, uh, has offered her. And I just thought that was awesome. And then the other two, and I, again, I, I'm just using a couple of examples of many out there right now, but Sydney McLaughlin and uh, Delilah Muhammad after they won uh, gold and silver in the 400 meter uh, women's hurdles. It's just great to see them with the American flag draped over their over their uh, shoulders and just how happy they were. And just, it was just amazing to watch those, uh, those three athletes do what they were doing. And what I loved about it was just from these three examples is these are black women proudly draped in the U S flag that the woke crowd would tell you represents a racist misogynistic society that is beyond reprieve. Um, and it seems the majority of athletes are proud and the small minority of whiners are the ones that get the soapbox. And, and unfortunately that's reality. And I think it's a shame. Needless to say, I'm extremely proud of those three women and thought their performances were amazing. Uh, it, in closing out this point, um, if you ever get really depressed about uh, what you're seeing on television in terms of this whole woke culture and just this 
nonstop um, negativity about the United States. S step back and just ask yourself, why do millions of people from all over the world, from all ethnicities and backgrounds still want to come to America? And I think the answer is, uplift is an uplifting one. We still are the land of opportunity and the greatest place on earth for an individual to realize their true potential. So the second point I wanted to uh, discuss was the globalist push for a great reset. And this, I think, is where the analogy of the boiling frog comes, uh, comes into play um, and how I think it's impacting our U.S. society. Um, by globalists, I mean the World Economic Forum and the Davos crowd that we talked about earlier. Just a few years ago, people who warned about globalists trying to promote world government control would have been considered conspiracy theorists. However, it was always there in the background and whitewashed by the mainstream media. All it needed was an international crisis for them to make their major push to realize the goal of, of global totalitarian control. And as if right on cue, we get COVID. And um, as I mentioned earlier, I don't believe in, in coincidences. Um, as a matter of fact, um, there was a documentary that um, believe it or not, was widely panned by the by the mainstream media, which for me doesn't doesn't hold much water in terms of uh, whether or not I think the the this documentary was good or not. Um, anyway, the documentary was talking about event tw uh, two thousand or event two o one, a pandemic simulation held in October of two thousand nineteen, months before the outbreak of COVID nineteen. It was a tabletop event held by Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, along with the World Economic Forum and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And then we all know what happened, after, basically two months after that, which is uh, COVID hits. And at one point in two thousand twenty, it seemed like the entire Earth was shut down. Um, Thomas DiLorenzo, who is uh, at lourockwell.com on March 21st of this year, wrote, the basic strategy was then, as it is now, to constantly frighten the gullible, pu the gullible public with predictions of the end of the world from environmental and other catastrophes, unless we abandon capitalism and adopt their socialist central planning. So keep that in mind, because as you do your research about this group, uh, that is the end state. And again, uh, from DiLorenzo, one of the WF's main desires is the abolition of private property. And, uh, former Danish Minister of the Environment, Ida Alken, was given a platform at a WF event to explain her definition of a good life. And uh, this is what she said. Um, her definition of a good life entailed the abolition of private property, Welcome to the year, this is, this is uh, Ida Aachen talking now. Welcome to the year 2030. I don't own anything. I don't own a car. I don't own a house. I don't own any appliances or any clothes. Someone else is using our house whenever we do not need it. I have no real privacy. Everything I do is recorded by the state. All in all, it is a good life. Aachen here is obviously dreaming of the good life um, where government owns everything and rent or lease everything back to their subjects. Of course, that means the politicians in her world would decide what you do and what you don't do and what you need and what you don't need. There'd be no such thing as a consumer as consumer sovereignty any more than there was in the Soviet Union, uh, apart from the black markets, um, which um, I consider the black markets were essentially capitalism uh, working on, in, underneath the, uh, the umbrella of the socialist uh, and communist uh, planned economy um, that obviously failed, as we all know. So do I think I'm that far off base in terms of being worried about this push for, uh, for getting rid of, of private property, which in my view, is one of the foundations of a free society and of a sovereign individual. So do I think that I'm that far off base? And the answer, unfortunately, is no. Um, and I use as an example, consider that BlackRock, the powerful private equity group, just recently purchased $1 billion worth of apartment buildings and more than 17,000 single family homes. And BlackRock, of course, is part of that Davos crowd. And it's not even just BlackRock, it's several other uh, private equity companies are gobbling up um, real estate, especially uh, taking advantage of 
um, all the problems that people are having um, keeping their homes in, in, uh, in this COVID pandemic. Also, you might want to check out uh, the mainstream media articles downplaying the importance of home ownership to the American dream. And you're starting to see those articles creep out more and more. Um, it's almost as if they are, are conditioning the public to not want to be homeowners. An article uh, from The Hill by Justin Haskins in 2020, and I'll quote here, uh, the general principles of the plan are clear. The world needs massive new government programs and far-reaching policies comparable to those offered by American socialists such as Senator Sanders and AOC from New York in their Green New Deal plan. Or put another way, we need a form of socialism, a word the World Economic Forum has deliberately avoided using all while calling for countless socialist and progressive plans. We need to design policies to align with investment in people and the environment, said the General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation, Sharon Burrow. But above all, the longer term perspective is about rebalancing economies. One of the main themes uh, in this past June meeting from, uh, uh, from Davos was that the coronavirus pandemic has created an important opportunity for many of the World Economic Forum's members to enact their radical transformation of capitalism, which they acknowledge would likely not have been made possible without that pandemic. Um, again, I don't believe in, in coincidences, but uh, do your own research and make up your own mind about, about what happened. Finally, why do I think this is happening? Where do I think it's going? And um, is, are there positive takeaways from, from the two points that I've discussed and, and the direction I think the United States is going? So if you have read books like Tragedy and Hope by Carol Quigley or, and, and other books that talk about sort of the global elite and what their plans are, um, this might sound familiar, that one of, the, one of the Rockefeller children, and obviously those are global elites who want global governance, was credited with saying something along the lines of, in order for a global government to work, the United States needs to be melded with the Soviet Union. Basically, what he and the rest of uh, the, the Davos crowd are saying is that as long as the United States remains a free and prosperous society, it will be too strong to bring it under the umbrella of global control. And it feels like to me that the globalist agenda has been relatively dormant, waiting for something like the COVID pandemic to shake the foundations of our society in order to control the United States. And I think that that is the direction that um, this great reset is, is taking us. And over the last 18 months, uh, since, the, since the pandemic really got kicked into high gear, they pulled out all the stops to make that a reality by trying to tear down the United States using any means necessary, including Hollywood and many professional athletes. And that's kind of that boiling frog analogy again, that uh, over these last 18 months that they're turning up the heat on that water pot, um, trying to get it to boil faster. So also by taking very real steps in making private property the cornerstone of a free and pro prosperous society, a thing of the past. So those two things, in my view, um, are really showing um, the WF and the world elites what their, what their true intentions are. And as Kit Knightley uh, of OffGuardian.org says in her article titled, Is This What's Really Behind the War on Home Ownership? She states, it always comes down to control. In short, a homeowner is independent, a renter is not. A renter can be controlled, a homeowner cannot. So that's just one, that's just one piece of the puzzle in terms of their ultimate desire for, for global control. So to close this out, what's my take on all of this that we've been talking about today? In order to bring the US into the global governance and control, it will need to be knocked down a few pegs, meaning we the people of the United States who've enjoyed one of the highest, if not the highest standards of living in the world will inevitably lose that. The WEF's goal of economic equity will, yes, it'll make all countries equal, equally poor, and the American dream will be lost in my view. I am, however, optimistic for one main reason, because even though we in America are divided like rarely we've seen in our history, that means half of us do not want America to lose its standing as the land of opportunity and prosperity. I believe that's a lot of people that won't give up and that are continuing to fight for our American way of life. And quite frankly, I'm on board with that. So uh, 
I appreciate your time. Thanks for listening. Uh, go ahead and press that like button and subscribe if you like what we're doing over here. And I'll close out by saying if you are in the military, the police departments, fire departments, or first responders, if that's you out there, thank you very much for your service. Stay safe. This is the Rain Man. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching Rain Man's Take, observations on the world we live in. If you like the content, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below. You can also follow Rain Man's Take on Instagram at Rain Man's Take. Also, check out our website at www.rainmanstakepodcast.com and send your comments to rainmanstake at gmail.com. Keep an eye out for future podcasts, which will be coming out every Thursday at 5 p.m. West Coast time.